Stanford University. Good afternoon and welcome to our second Hoover Lunch of the Year. We're excited today to introduce to you uh, Bill Whalen, a research fellow who specializes in California and United States politics. I um, just want to let you know that this session will be uh, broadcasted live over the internet and will appear on uh, iTunes in the coming weeks. Um, while, B while Mr. Whalen is speaking, please um, think of questions to ask him. We will be having a question and answer session at the end. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for coming out. I hope you enjoy your pizza. Chew quietly if you don't mind. Um, let's talk uh, a little bit about what happened on Tuesday night nationally. Uh, let's talk mercifully very little about what happened here in California on Tuesday night. As far as the Republican cause goes, then I'll just uh, throw it open to you guys to ask questions as you like. Uh, looking at this election nationally, if you're a Republican and you did not like what happened on Tuesday night, then you are, in a word, greedy. Uh, the GOP picked up at least 60 seats uh, in the House, and we're still counting. The last I checked, the margin is 240 to 189, with uh, six undecided, including two here in California. Uh, that means the Republicans coming into the next section of Congress will have a working margin of at least 20 to 25 seats, meaning that on any party line vote they can lose 10, 20 members and still get something passed. They control the House. Uh, the Senate Republicans picked up six. Um, that's one where you can you know, talk a little glass half empty. Uh, if, if the GOP had had better candidates in Nevada and Delaware, they would have picked up two more seats, uh, but six is not bad. And 47 puts Republicans within striking distance in uh, 2012. And if you take a very, very early look at the 2012 Senate races, there are some Democrats like Ben Nelson in Nebraska, uh, Jim Webb in Virginia, who are uh, skating on some very thin ice, to, to say the least. So you could come away from the 2012 election with uh, control of the Senate in addition to the House, which means it's truly the Republicans' gains. I worked in a past life for a Governor uh, Pete Wilson, Governor of California, who preceded Gray Davis, who preceded uh, the big guy with the Austrian accent who now leaves office. And uh, thus, I have a real fondness toward governors and what they do at the state level. When you watch reforms happen in Washington, welfare reform, for example, it happens because, frankly, it's been done already at the state level. Uh, the way it works in politics, the states lead, Washington tends to follow, not the other way around. The state proves something can work, Washington then jumps on the bandwagon and, and does it as well. Governors are, to me, where the juice is at all times. And if you look at the gubernatorial results for the Republicans, it was a pretty good night. Going into the election, the Democrats held 26 of the 50 gubernatorial seats across the country. After the votes were counted, Republicans had 29 and the Democrats had 19. And there is one undecided still in Minnesota where I think the Republican Mark Dayton leads by a few votes. So you could have 30 Republican governors. And why did this matter? Quite simply this. It is very easy to get exhilarated after results of an election and similarly to be depressed after results of an election. But at all times, you have to be patient and you have to keep looking at the big picture. It's a very, very fluid thing, American politics. Things change constantly. If you were a Democrat right after the 2004 election, you were depressed. John Kerry ran a poor campaign. You can't believe he lost to George Bush. You didn't make gains in the congressional election. You were depressed. But then guess what? Two years later, you got back control of Congress. And two years after that, you got the presidency. Coming out of 2008, you're a Democrat, you're riding high. Now all of a sudden, you've lost the House, you're worried about losing the Senate, and you're very worried about your president being a one-term act. So things change. Republicans who were depressed after 2008, having had a bad campaign with John McCain, having taken it in the, in the shorts in the congressional level, they were depressed. Now they're feeling better about things. So this, this situation in politics at all times is constantly changing. So look at the big picture. And the big picture of the Republicans works like this. You ask, what is the pipeline for the Republican Party? What is the future? Well, number one, look at Barack Obama. He may win re-election, maybe he doesn't in 2012. If I'm a betting man, I probably bet on him winning. And why is that? Go back the last 100 years in politics, and how many presidents do you find who lost seeking a second term? Only four of them. There's Taft, there's Herbert Hoover in 1932, Jim Acotta in 1980, and then George H.W. Bush in 1992. And these gentlemen have some very common themes to their defeats. In the case of Hoover, it's economic depression. In the case of Bush the Elder, it's an economy going bad, soft, a recession he couldn't shake out of in 1992. I worked on that campaign, by the way. It's another story for another day. Uh, in 1912 with William Howard Taft, it is a intra-party squabble. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt bolts the Republican Party, creates the Bull Moose Party, and takes Republicans with him, splits the party, destroys Taft's candidacy. Then in, 1970, in 1980 with Jimmy Carter, he gets the worst of both worlds. He has both a bad economy, and he gets challenged uh, on the left as well from Ted Kennedy. And don't forget Jerry Brown here in California. 
So you look at 2012 and you ask yourself, what faces Barack Obama? Is it the economy? Maybe it goes from bad to worse, but odds are the economy stabilizes, maybe even improves. So the economy doesn't work against him. If I'm Barack Obama, the two people I'm worried about when I get up in the morning right now are two people you probably don't take seriously. And one is Dennis Kucinich, and the other one is Howard Dean. And why those two people, you ask? Because both of them have a burr under the saddle. They have a chip on their shoulder. Both feel that Barack Obama is disregarding his political left. They're disappointed on health care. They're disappointed on things like don't ask, don't tell. They think that Afghanistan is the new Vietnam. And both are sitting out there poised and thinking about challenging him in 2012. Now, would either one knock him off? No. But what they could do is what Pat Buchanan did to George H.W. Bush in 1992. Run against him, remain a distraction and a pain in the butt at all times, take away a quarter to a third of the votes in the primaries, and make him look weak. And the problem for a presidential candidate is when you've been weakened in the primaries by someone attacking you from your party's base, that weakness carries over in the general election, and sometimes you don't regain your balance, your momentum, and you lose. So if I'm Obama, I'm worried about that. So if you're Republican, you see hope in 2012 presidentially, but realistically, you're probably looking at 2016, and here's where you should probably smile. Let's go back to the governors for a second. Jimmy Carter was elected governor of Georgia in 1970. Six years later, he is elected president of the United States. George W. Bush is elected governor of Texas in 1994. Story overlooked on election night in 1994. Everyone was talking about Newt Gingrich and the Republicans in Congress, and there's George W. Bush being elected governor of Texas. Six years later, he's president of the United States. You go back to Bill Clinton, who was elected governor of Arkansas in 1978, kicked out of office in 1980, regains the office in 1982. He was poised to run in 1988, but decided against it for a lot of good reasons. But he ends up getting it in 1992. You can see this trend of governors six years into their office running for president. So I would look at these Republicans who came storming into office in 2010, people like maybe John Kasich in Ohio and others, and think that maybe there's a future president in that batch. It's the six-year path. The other reason why you should be jazzed about what's going on with Republicans right now nationally, Republicans gained 600 legislative seats on election night nationwide. 600. Nothing to show here in California, but the rest across America, 600. If you're running a baseball franchise, this is the equivalent of your major league franchise having a good single-A team starting up. These legislators are going to crawl away up the ladder. They're going to win statewide offices. Eventually, they're going to run for governor and Senate, maybe one day president. This is your future. So the Republicans are in good shape as you look down the path. So nationally, things are hunky-dory. Uh, to take the song out of La Caja Fall, it's the best of times for Republicans in that respect. But if you shift to California, we go Dickensian. It's the best of times. It's the worst of times. And here's why. While the rest of the country was going red, California maintained its very, very blue coloring. I don't know where you guys were last Tuesday night. <clears throat> I was at home fighting off a cold, which I, I apologize. I still <coughs> have a trace of it, so if I, I cough in the middle of this, please forgive me. But I was at home watching election night, doing some radio shows. And when you watch election nights out here, it's a real funny thing I've, I've come to observe. Polls close on the East Coast at 5 o'clock our time. So you turn on your TV at 5 o'clock, you start watching the national news, and you just kind of hear all the talk and all the buzz. And as 5 o'clock leads to 6 o'clock, you start seeing trends. And for me, what I watch is certain elections, which maybe you're kind of on the cusp where the Republicans should win. I want to see how fast they're called. For example, Marco Rubio in Florida, his race was called just about the second the polls were closed. That told me very early on, it's going to be a pretty good night for Republicans. So five leads to six, six leads to seven, and you can see it on the last Tuesday night, it was just building up as a very, very good night for Republicans. So come seven o'clock, I'm sitting there thinking, boy, I can't wait till eight o'clock comes and the polls close and we're gonna see what's gonna happen out here. So sure enough, eight o'clock, clock's right, it's 12, it's eight o'clock, on comes Fox News, and at eight o'clock and 30 seconds, Fox News calls the governor's race for Jerry Brown and the Senate race for Carly Farina. Boom, 30 seconds and eight o'clock hour. We didn't get a half an hour, an hour's worth of pleasure out of it. 30 seconds in, we're gone. Just like that, lickety split. Uh, amazing, even, even by California standards. This is not the first time, by the way, in California that you've had this phenomenon where Republicans did well other places in the country, but not here in California. 2002, for example, was not a bad year congressionally for Republicans. Certainly not this, but not a bad year. But here in California, not only did the Republicans lose the gubernatorial contest, we lost every statewide constitutional office as well, all seven of them. This time around, the same may happen. The attorney general's race is still sitting out there with Steve Cooley. The votes are still being counted. It's a painstaking thing. I talked to one of Cooley's people last night, and one day they're ahead, one day they're down. It's like Homer Simpson going woohoo one day and doe the next. You just, you just don't know what's happening. But they think they're going to pull that out. <clears throat> so the question is, what went wrong in California? 
You listen to the consultants, the people who ran these campaigns, and they have some ready-made excuses. Before I get into this, let me, let me, let me offer one, one, one important thing here. I didn't work on Carly's campaign, uh, except for helping her on a couple of speeches very early on. I didn't work on Meg's campaign. Uh, I, I don't have a grudge for not working on them, so I'm not grinding an axe here. I know the people who ran both their campaigns. I like them all. I respect the jobs they do. Uh, but that said, I retain the right to be critical, so I'm going to try to offer what I hope you take as constructive criticism and not piling on. I hate those books in politics, the people who leave an office and then write the obligatory, if only they'd listen to me book. You know, I was the only person in the room who knew it all. You know, I, just, I hate those kinds of books. But the consultants out here have some ready-made excuses for what wrong. And the first thing they talk about, pardon me, is the numbers. And they're right. California's a big state, and there are a lot more Democrats than there are Republicans. If you just look at the voter registration, it's an advantage of about 2.3 million votes. Uh, that's a lot more Indians and Cowboys out there on the plains. So the question is, if you're running a Republican campaign in California, how do you make up that kind of disadvantage? Well, to just do it on registration alone means that a heck of a lot of Republicans have to turn out on election night, and for some reason, they all have to get the flu, they have to, all have to be told that the vote's on Wednesday and not Tuesday, the Democrats have to stay home to make up that 2.3 million advantage. And of course, that doesn't happen. So what this means for Republicans is they have to win in the middle with what we call decline to states, DTSs or independents. Leave it to government at all times to come up with three words when one suffices. An independent California is what we call decline to state. But DTSs in California, the independents, make up about 20% of the vote in statewide elections. And Republicans need to win about three-fifths or 60% of those votes to win a statewide election. It's plain and simple. It's a doable preface. It's doable if you run the right kind of campaign which leads us to the issues of Meg Whitman and Carly Farina and why they did not run the right kind of campaign. With Carly, I think it's pretty simple. I think with Carly, it's mainly a money issue. It takes a lot of money to unseat an incumbent senator in California, especially if it's Barbara Boxer. If you're a first-time candidate like Carly Farina and you're not that well-run statewide, you need arguably three big piles of money to do the job against Barbara Boxer. Pile of money, number one, is biographical money. You have to spend 10 or 20 million dollars just saying, what a great person I am. Here's my life story. Love me, hug me. You need a second pile of money saying what a horrible individual my opponent is. In other words, making the argument as to why she should be kicked out of office. Then you need a third pile of money because you know the Barbara Boxer in particular, incumbents in general, but Barbara Boxer in particular, are going to run a very negative campaign against you. And that's what she did against Carly Farina. They dumped on Carly day and night, going on a record as a CEO of HP, exporting jobs, and is a very effective hit. Carly had maybe one and a half bags of money, I think. She didn't have enough money to get the entire job done. With those three big bags of money, maybe she can pull it off, maybe it happens, but we'll never know. Whitman's a little more complicated to explain. Everyone focuses on the money. Uh, what, $140 million in personal fortune? Uh, maybe another 20 or 30 million topped onto it. You read stories every day about doing the math translating. You take 160 million dollars and <clears throat> divide it by 3.4 million votes. How many dollars per vote that translate to in the most ever? It's not the most ever spent on a, uh, on a major political campaign, by the way. Michael Bloomberg is the gold standard for this. Uh, Michael Bloomberg ran for a third term uh, for mayor of uh, New York in 2009, and there was no escaping his campaign. I, uh, carry around my little iPhone at all times, sorry to advertise Apple, and I have an app on here for baseball. When I walk my dog late in the afternoon, I love to listen to baseball games. I like to listen to the Yankees in particular. When you listen to Yankees games in 2009, you could not escape Michael Bloomberg ads. They were everywhere to be found, just about every inning. Hi, it's Michael Bloomberg. Ah, go away. Michael Bloomberg spent $109 million in his mayoral election, 109, to get about 550,000 votes. That's about $186 in spare change per vote. That's a little, little out of Meg's league who do, do the math on whatever 160 divided by 3.4 is, is what, 50-some 50, 50 dollars, so not even close. But the money is breathtaking, that said, to spend $140 million of your own fortune. And of course, everybody wants to use the cliche, money can't buy you love, ha, ha, ha. So what went wrong with her campaign? I think strategically, there were two mistakes here. This is just my thinking, but just I think she made two core mistakes. Number one, you're a first-time candidate, which she is. So she has to introduce herself to the people of California. I think challenge number one, which she didn't meet, was that she needed to create a good biography for herself and something beyond just being this fabulously successful chairperson of eBay. If you watch Jerry Brown's campaign, you notice Jerry did not attack her record at eBay. It really, you just couldn't assail it. 
She took a small company, she made it into a big company, created a lot of jobs, a lot of wealth for people, and a lot of success stories. He wasn't going to take that on. Uh-uh. That would have been a stupid argument for him. So what did he do? He attacked her personal character. So you had her as being wealthy, trying to buy the election, and then came the hit job with the housekeeper. So she's wealthy and she's mean. She wouldn't come to bat for a housekeeper. And then they tatted out the fact that she didn't have a good voting record, so she's kind of insensitive to the world and the public. They ridiculed her, essentially. They just tore apart her character. I think it would have made a lot of sense for Whitman, and granted this is hindsight, and hindsight's always 2020. but it would have made a lot of sense for Whitman to have spent money introducing herself as a multi-dimensional human being, something beyond just a wealthy person who is a successful CEO. And I think this was a real challenge for her. There once upon a time was a standard in American politics where if I looked at any of you as a future candidate, what I would have done is I would have thought, how do I market this person? How do I sell this person as an article for Time magazine? In other words, how innovative is this person? How visionary is this person? How California? This has to be the coolest thing in California since fusion food. How do I get this person into Time magazine? Well, I think the game has changed in the last 15 years or so, and it's now not a question of getting into Time magazine. It's a question of how to get into People magazine. We become accustomed to candidates who are empathetic, who are warm, and frankly, tug our heartstrings, and we want to feel better about voting for them based on what they've gone through in their lives. Think about this for a second. Barack Obama runs for president in 2008. Having written books about his childhood, what it's like to grow up in a multicultural society as a, as a creation of a black man and a white woman. So voting for Barack Obama, we like his life story. It makes us feel good to vote about Barack Obama. George W. Bush runs for president in 2000. In part of his campaign, he talks about kicking the bottle and marrying this woman, woman, wonderful woman named Laura Bush and finding God and turning his life around. It makes us feel good that way. They like this guy. He turned his life around. Bill Clinton, when he runs for president in 1992, what do we find out about him? He never knew his father. His father dies in a car crash before he's born. So here's Bill Clinton, tugs at our heartstrings. And the list goes on. John McCain, who, when he first ran for president in 2000, didn't like to talk much about his experience in Vietnam. He ran for president again in 2008. He was much more open talking about it. Meg Whitman did not talk much about herself and didn't really offer, himself, or offer herself in a way that we should come used to in terms of the warm and fuzzies. Uh, it may be that she was just reluctant to do this. And keep in mind, when you look at a candidate and they fall short, you never know quite what goes on inside the campaign. Maybe it's consultants giving the candidate bad advice. Maybe the candidate just didn't like what the consultants were offering and pushed back. Some candidates are good about this, some are not. But Whitman never offered herself really as a, as a wife, a mother, a daughter, a dimensional human being. And I don't want to sound a misogynist here, but I think this is especially a challenge for women when they run for office because at all times we're trying to judge women in terms of their warm side and their hard side. And if you watched Hillary Clinton when she ran for president in 2008, she struggled with this mildly. How soft should I be? How Amazonian should I be? How, how tough should I be on this day? How nice should I be on this day? She could never strike that happy balance if you could. Whitman, I don't think, ever really bothered to find that balance if you would. And I think that challenged her. I think her curse in this campaign was, ironically enough, the blessing she's had in life. She grew up with a very nice middle class existence in Long Island. She went to Princeton. She got her MBA at Harvard. She met a uh, wonderful man who she married who's a surgeon for crying out loud. They have a home in Atherton. It's not a tragic story. I think probably the greatest tragedy is when she looks at her property taxes each month in Atherton. <laughs> uh, outside of that, though, there's not a lot of hardship and rigor. You compare that to Carly Farina, by the way, who, if you went to one of Carly's events, she would talk very openly about climbing her way up the ladder in business, starting out as a receptionist. Uh, those of you who watch Mad Men, for example, uh, can appreciate that back in the 1960s, you know, the business world was very tough this way. It's very hard for women to start out. Sandra Day O'Connor, for example, famously, you know, could not get work in law firms as a woman. Um, Carly Farina started as receptionist. She had to claw her way up the ladder. So she'd talk about that struggle. She would also talk about what it's like to go through breast cancer. She was very warm and empathetic. She made much more of a bond. Now, yes, she lost big two, but for Whitman, Whitman just never connected that way. So I think that was mistake number one. The second mistake I think she made was that she never quite tied herself into public sentiment in California. There are right track and wrong track elections in American politics. This was a seriously wrong track election. Polls show that 8 out of 10 Californians think the state's going in a bad direction, begging the question of what those other two people are looking at. Um, <laughs> so you have voters who are in a foul mood. They're in a snit. They're also not happy with government. If you looked at the ballot of the nine measures on the ballot, those which pertain to government, people tend to poo-poo the ones pertaining to government. Proposition 19, for example, medicinal marijuana, uh, personal recreational use of marijuana. It was sold as what? Giving more money to the state in terms of revenue. Eh, thumbs down. 
Proposition 21, I uh, wanted to slap $18 fee on your license plate for state parks. More money for the state. Eh, thumbs down. So people were in kind of a foul mood in the way that they voted on, on Tuesday night in California. But women's campaign didn't really tap into that mood. And I think what they should have done is they should have looked at the big guy with the Austrian accent, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now, granted, Arnold had advantages and has advantages in this world that few human beings do in general, but as politicians in particular. He has a 90% name recognition, number one. Secondly, people just kind of get into him when he shows up. If he walks in this, if he walked in this room, right, hi Arnold. If he walked in this room right now, trust me, it would get very strange in here. People get just goofy in his presence. It's a celebrity thing. Uh, those of you who are hanging out with George Clooney the other night probably saw this phenomenon too. Now, I apologize if any of you thought you're getting Clooney today. I know this is a bit of a drop off, but. <laughs> But uh, no, Arnold, so Arnold has kind of a funny effect on people. But when Arnold first ran for office in 2003, he ran a really smart campaign in the recall campaign. Yes, he had this luxury. He ran only, uh, only a 60-day campaign. And if you remember, he took about the first two weeks of that campaign off, kind of hit from the press. So it was only about a 45-day campaign. But what Arnold, what Arnold did was he realized the people are in a bad mood. And he asked, what are they mad about? And I'll do something about it. Well, in that election, people were upset about the car tax, the vehicle license fee being increased. So Arnold says, I'm going to get into office. I'm going to fix it. People were upset about rolling blackouts. People were upset about a, crime, about a law that Governor Davis had signed giving driver's license to illegal immigrants. So what Arnold did was he ran against these very specific things and said on the first day in, on the job, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. So even if you thought that maybe Arnold as a governor was kind of a, you know, sort of an out there proposition, when he started talking, you realize that, you know, geez, Arnold, number one, understands why I'm upset. And number two, by God, he's going to do something the first days in the job to fix this. I'm with him. She didn't tap into this. Meg Whitman didn't. Uh, she didn't. She ran very long on generalities. I'm going to take a business-like approach to government. I'm going to take, you know, can do Silicon Valley to Sacramento and do. Uh, we're going to, you know, create jobs, improve our schools, yada, yada, yada. She never gave you a specific as to what you're upset about in California and how she's going to fix it. And to me, the one thing which she missed, which she didn't tap into, was pensions, public pensions. There were initiative votes up and down the state on public pensions at the city municipal level. And with the exception of Proposition B in San Francisco, I think just about everyone passed. Um, I wonder what would have happened if from the very beginning she had run a campaign saying that I'm going to fix this pension mess in California. And I'm going to sit down at the legislature. I'm going to call a special session of the legislature my first day in office. And I'm going to call them in and make them sit down and fix it. And they're more than happy to work with me. I'd be more than willing to take their input and do it together. If they don't want to help me, I'm going to take it to the ballot and work with you, the people. And I wonder, maybe she still would have lost, but maybe it would have been a little closer than what happened. So I think, in retrospect, she needed to find a specific issue to tap into and just kind of capture the public sentiment. Um, final thought here, then I'll open up to Q&A. Um, Nationally, we talked about the farm team with the Republicans, all these legislators coming in, and in California, it's just the opposite. Uh, we don't have a farm team right now. Whitman ran for the first time as a, for, for governor. Carly Farina ran for the first time for the Senate. Uh, Damon Dunn, proud, proud, product, proud product here of the farm, ran for the first time Secretary of State. We don't have a lot of people sitting in office right now who are running for statewide offices. And this is a problem. And you see this, especially in the governor's race, but in general. First-time candidates are really rolls of the dice. It's, it's somebody who's never done the job before. Sometimes like Ronald Reagan in 1966 or Arnold Schwarzenegger in the recall, they take like a duck to water and they're really wonderful candidates. Other times, and I think probably with the Whitman campaign, this is an example, it's a little more problematic. It's a little more difficult to make them sizzle as a candidate. It helps to start somebody very early in the process to run for a city council, a, a county supervisor job, build up to mayor, get in the legislature, take on a smaller statewide office before you go for the big boy race for governor of the Senate. So not only do you have a track record of accomplishment as a politician, but you're a very seasoned politician. You're not getting curveballs thrown at you for the first time. You're not, you don't know what it's like for the first time to get you know, get a cheap shot thrown at you at two weeks to go in the race. You're a seasoned politician. That makes you a better campaigner. So the challenge for the Republican Party here in California, it's going to be to grow a team here in the next decade or so. Uh, while the focus will be on who do we run for the Senate and who do we run for governor, I think the party at the same time has to focus downstream, if you will. It has to look at smaller races. I can give you three or four people who I think are very good, small, local politicians right now, Republicans in California, who have a future if they so choose. I think the party has to find more successes like that. It means getting people more engaged in the party. And finally, that's the other thing the Republican Party has to do. It's going to have to grow the party, plain and simple. 
Uh, the Republicans have been bleeding in California for the past decade uh, to the point now where we have this 2.3 million deficit in registered voters. It's hard for a party to continue statewide with that. So the party's going to have to ask itself the question, why are we losing people in registered voters? Is it because we get into too many ideological battles? Are we just not offering the right message at election time? Do we have to do a better job of recruiting candidates? All very ser serious questions to ask. But I would emphasize this, as easy it is to get depressed about the results, things do change in politics. I remember talking to a lot of depressed Republicans after election night in 2002 here in California. Gray Davis had just been reelected. Uh, the Democrats had won every statewide office, and Republicans were wondering, why would we even bother to run? 11 months later, Gray Davis was out of office. So things can change in politics very fast. Jerry Brown now has to work with the state legislature in Sacramento, which is going to be very stubborn. He's going to find it's not the way it operated in the 70s and the 80s, the last time he was governor. It's a different town with a different set of rules. Maybe he's a productive governor, maybe he's not. But you might have the same dynamic of the Democrats working together, controlling everything in Sacramento. And maybe they'll be good with it, but it's also the argument that you give somebody enough rope, they ultimately they hang himself as well. So we'll see how that turns out. With that, I think I've rambled on long enough. I'd love to take your questions, so fire away. Sure. Yeah, the one rule we have is we have a uh, we have a mic, so so everybody can hear it. Just pass around the mic and talk into it. Hi. So you talked about the um, the gain in the local uh, state legislatures and the governor's right. race. How's this going to affect redistricting in the next ten years? Is it a big deal, a small deal, et cetera? Uh, it's an enormous deal uh, for this simple reason. Uh, as you know, redistricting works, uh, with the exception of California, which has now changed the rules. We've created this uh, nonpartisan redistricting process. In other states, the legislature has to come up with a draft and the governor has to sign off. If, it is, uh, if there's a Republican governor or a Democratic governor and the other party controls the legislature, split power, then usually it ends up in court, uh, hammered out in court in a compromise. But you look around the country, and I believe right now the Republicans control 22 states nationwide with both Republican governor, Republican legislature. I did the math on this. Republicans right now control one. If you look at states where there's a Republican governor and Republican legislature, Republicans now control 197 congressional districts, and the Democrats control 49. So that means if the Republicans just do the right job in those states, they're going to essentially have at least 197 districts coming back plus however many more they gain in states like Texas and Arizona and Florida. So this adds to the Democrats' complications in, in 2012. In addition to having to pick up about 25 seats just around the nation, they're going to have to find ways to make up grounds in the Sun Belt states I just mentioned. So uh, this, again, is why the gubernatorial contests were huge, but just why this trend is positive for Republicans from the down working its way up. What are some of the measures we can take to increase the number of registered Republican voters in California? Um, shoe leather is how it begins. You simply have to pound the pavement and get out the vote. Um, the second way you do it is uh, through ballot initiatives sometimes. You find initiatives which appeal to youth. Uh, this was one of the Democrats' hopes with Prop 19 this year. The Democrats were calculating uh, that in an election year where Barack Obama was off the ballot, so there'd be a, kind of a natural fall off of the youth vote, uh, how do you get the youth back in? And so some Democrats were calculating that you do it with marijuana. <laughs> but curiously, it didn't work for some reason with the youth vote. I just I don't know if they just don't care enough about it. I don't know if it's already legally available. Uh, the analogy I use about marijuana is that uh, marijuana is you find marijuana in California hot tubs the way you found al where you find alligators in ponds in Florida. It's, I walk my dog late at night around California. You know, you catch it in the air. But um, so I don't. Maybe it's just already available for most campus students. Uh, I was frustrated when Prop 19 lost. I, I had a fully pledged criminal op enterprise ready to roll. I figured it this way. <laughs> <laughs> I had it up. I had this. You know, we're on the internet. I probably shouldn't say this, but I had this. I had this figured out. The way Prop 19 worked was, if you wanted to grow your own in California, you could grow it under a 25 square foot limit, a five by five limit. So I figured, look, in these in these limited times of state resources, there is no way that Elliot Ness is going to go door to door in California, going into my backyard to see if I'm sticking to 25 feet. So if I just if I had the cojones and the criminal intent, what I figured I'd do is I just find a big open space up in the up in the woodland hills, grow a big old crop, and get a few of you young-minded people to to be my mule and pass it around the campus and just sell bags left and right. We'll do it underground. The state will never rob it. Cha-ching, we'll all make a ton of money. <laughs> and this was a problem with the economic argument because the idea is, well, the state legally sells it, so the state's getting a lot of money. 
baloney, believe me. If if if, uh, if you know if a low life like me could figure this out, someone limited in challenges like myself could figure out this. Somebody could go up the far more sophisticated operation. There been a lot of marijuana sold in California. The state would not have reaped a dime of it. But you ask how to get young people to turn out. Uh, part of it the initiative process, but I think plain and simple, you've got to come up with candidates who connect with people. Uh, sadly, I think this is one of the very bad parts of the Schwarzenegger legacy, in that you know the Republicans had him in office for seven years, and. You know, in retrospect, I don't know if history is going to show that the Republican Party did not do a good job of corralling Arnold, or maybe Arnold just didn't care about working with the Republican Party. But there was a very big missed opportunity to take this enormously popular guy, a very likable guy, just you know, a great success story, and just a really, you know, a real engaging guy, and you know, take him out and talk to younger Californians and talk about his life and explain why he is Republican and try, you know, for lack of a better word, to try to make the Republican Party more cool, more, you know, more acceptable at your age level. But we miss that here in California, and that's a problem. So we're going to have to not only come up with people who can win statewide elections, but also people who frankly can sit in rooms like this and relate to you and, and talk to things that, you know, talk to you about things that you care about and understand about, and, you know, you will come away liking. Um, do you believe that Republicans have a problem uh, uh, according to the Hispanic vote, uh, specifically in states like California and Colorado, this election? Yeah, it, um, Nevada actually is where it stood out besides California. Uh, the Nevada vote was crippling to Sharon Engel uh, in a race against Harry Reid. It was a difference maker. And here in California, you saw just what, what an absolute torpedo it was in the Meg Whitman. Uh, for all the money, well, we talk about the money that she was spending in her campaign, she was actually investing very heavily in Hispanic media. And what she was doing, she was trying to sell herself as a likable, engaging person. She was, they were doing ads of showing her sitting down and talking to students and, again, humanizing her in the way that I talked about earlier that she, I thought she needed to do on a broader level. They were trying to make her a nice, likable person to Hispanics, defang the Republican image in the Hispanic community. And it was working. She was actually polling at about 40% in the Hispanic community in California. And then along comes a woman named Nikki. And you guys probably saw what happened then. She comes out, she does the press conference with Gloria Allred, and now she has a problem. Meg Whitman has a real problem in the Hispanic community. And the problem, I'd argue, that she had in the Hispanic community, if you remember back uh, in the Bush administration, uh, the Bush administration began its war on terrorism and realized that one of the ways it had to go about doing this was it had to talk directly to the Arab community, to the Arab world, and speak in, speak in Arabic and explain the United States is not the devil. And so they, they engage Karen Hughes, their very top aide, to begin the State Department initiative to sell the United States of America to the Arab world. The problem was they were working through this filter called Al Jazeera, which is just horribly biased and does not represent the United States in a fair way, I'm afraid. The problem Meg Whitman ran into is that there was a problem for Republicans through the Hispanic media in California as well, and that things get twisted and they get distorted. And when the, when the whole saga of Nikki broke, it, it killed her in the Hispanic community, in part because the, the media took this and ran with it, and all of a sudden she just became this epitome of a callous, wealthy woman who cares not for poor working Hispanics. But then secondly, this gets the other problem that Republicans have in California, SEIU, the union, Service Employee Industry Union, they spent about $5 million right away on Hispanic media attacking Meg Whitman, and it just killed her. And I think she got about, Whitman got about 18% of the vote. They were anticipating going to the election, they needed about 30 to 32 percent of the Hispanic vote to win statewide in California. She got about 18 percent. In itself, not the difference maker because you figure the Hispanic vote is about one-fifth of the vote overall between one-fourth and one-fifth. So you take a 14-point deficit but divide that by four or five, so it's only about three or four points off the top. Uh, but it was a problem for her, so a problem for Republicans. The other problem Whitman had, by the way, besides Hispanics, women. And this is something else we're going to have to figure out why she went wrong. She lost by about 15 points to Jerry Brown among women. And, you know, for reasons I, I can't explain, except maybe they just didn't like her personally. Because here's somebody who's, who's cracked the glass ceiling. And on social issues, the Whitman campaign went out of its way to be as socially moderate and uncontroversial as it could be, specifically on the issue of abortion choice. So for all the reasons that women supposedly are supposed to walk away from a fellow woman candidate, they think maybe they think she's too conservative, too radical, they walked away from her in California. So it's another problem Republicans are going to have to uh, go after. It's just in addition to the Hispanic gap, the gender gap. Isn't this a fun, uplifting talk? <laughs> <laughs> What do you think uh, D.C. looks like over the next two years? 
Uh, DC looks like. I am, by the way, I'm a native of Washington, D.C. I'm one of these very uh, rare people who grew up inside the Beltway and moved out. Usually it's a different migration. Uh, I can remember Washington, um, it was much smaller, not as much the political company town uh, that it is now. I think D.C. is a town full of a lot of intrigue uh, for the next two years is the long and simple of it. Um, there is intrigue over how the shift in power works. Uh, if you remember back in 1995 when uh, the Republicans took over the Congress, that was the plot for the next two years. Bill Clinton, the morning after the election, famously said the presidency, the president is not irrelevant. Just a very kind of angry, wounded thing for him to say, but he was trying to say that, you know, by God, I still matter here. I still count. It's Newt Gingrich is not in charge. And so you had this kind of power struggle between these two great men children and Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich going on all the time. It's this kind of great psycho study going on. Um, Barack Obama and John Boehner and Mitch McConnell and Harry Reid are not as complicated as uh, Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich at the end of the day. But that said, there's still a lot of interesting power struggles going on. And I think one of the most interesting struggles is going to be within the Republican Party itself. Uh, John Boehner is the speaker. He will be elected speaker, but there are a bunch of young Turks sitting underneath him who are decidedly more conservative than him, decidedly more activist and decidedly more pushy when it comes to changing the way things are done in Washington. And I'm thinking of people like Mike Pence and uh, Jeff Flake and Paul Ryan, you know, the, you know, the younger guys, the next generation, if you will. And they're going to push the speaker at all times uh, to change things, earmarks being a very good example of this. And then you shift over to the Senate, where there's a really big, ugly battle brewing between Mitch McConnell and Jim DeMint from South Carolina. And Jim DeMint is, uh, is what I call kind of a scorched earth conservative. And that he, uh, he famously said at one point that I'd rather have 30 people like myself in the Senate than 51 people who I, who I couldn't abide. So what he's saying is that purity matters and conservative philosophy matters to him. And whereas Mitch, Mitch McConnell is more old school Republican, is much more the deal maker, if you will. So DeMint is going to bring in these young senators and he's going to try to push against McConnell at all times. And I think at some point, you know, McConnell's going to have to figure out what to do with Jim DeMint. Uh, so this is kind of this interesting fight to watch, I think, among the Republicans in that respect. I don't know how Obama comes out swinging uh, next year, um, to the extent he comes out swinging. It's an interesting thing to watch. When Clinton was chastened after 1994, he had lost, and I mentioned that governor's race in uh, 1980, so he knew what it was like to be kicked to the curb. And Clinton was also just a political animal, knew what it was like to survive. But what people also neglect is that for all the talk about Bill Clinton moving to the right on welfare reform and signing defense of marriage and things like that to get reelected, he campaigned in 1992 and welfare as we know it. He was by nature already kind of a right of center Democrat. Uh, he had been in a big squabble with the Democratic liberals leading up to 1992. He was the head of a group called the Democratic Leadership Council. He was already going around the country saying that, geez, you know, we're putting people like Mike Dukakis on the national ticket and don't do Mario Cuomo. It's just a ticket to death. We need people from the South, wink nod, who are more, you know, centrist in their philosophy. And, you know, here I am, by the way, as a guy who worked on welfare in my state and I've executed people and, you know, I'm a tough guy and I can get elected nationally. And Clinton was right in terms of his party. So for Clinton to, you know, eat dirt, and work with the Republicans, you know, much, much easier thing to do because philosophically he was already kind of there. Obama, though, to compromise with the Republicans, unless it's something symbolic like signing earmark reform, you know, whatever earmark reform is going to be, you talk about, you know, it depends what is is. Um, I don't know if he's capable of eating dirt because Obama has not really, doesn't know what it's like to lose. I think he lost once when he ran in a primary for Congress against Bobby Rush a long time ago. Uh, but since then, he has you know, had a very charmed political life and just, he's had very easy elections and very good opponents to run against. So he doesn't know what it's like to be personally rejected or to have people question what it is he's doing. So we don't know what's going on in his world right now in his political world in terms of how they read the elections. Pelosi is a great example of this. You know, Pelosi, you know, Shakespeare famously asked, you know, the fault lies not in the stars but in ourselves. Uh, Pelosi clearly thinks the fault lies in the stars and not herself because she said, well, you know, if we just message things better, you know, you know these, these poor people in flyover states would understand, you know, all the wonderful things we've done. She doesn't take it as a personal rejection. Wrong. It was very personal. Um, I don't know how Obama interprets things right now besides obviously going the same route about saying, well, you know, it's the messaging and then we gave 50 health care speeches. So it'll be very interesting to see how he comes out um, in doing and all that. I still, though, I still think he will get reelected. Uh, the party is a very good campaigner. Historically, it's hard to unseat presidents. And also, you look at the cast of characters right now on the Republican side, and I, I don't know, I'd be curious to who you guys are behind right now, but you know, a lot of these candidates are challenged in various ways running against them. They're either not as good a campaigner as him, uh, 
Mitt Romney will be the front runner nominally in the polls, assuming Sarah Palin's not running. That's another story in itself. But you know, Romney has an enormous bullseye on his back, both both being the front runner, but also having signed health care reform in his state. So, if it's not him, then you know you're looking at who Mike Huckabee or maybe uh, Tim Pawlenty from Minnesota. You know, it's not murderer's row by any means. So, um, we will see. But it's going to be a very fun town to watch. Um, what do you see as the future of the uh, Republican Party chair? Uh, there's been a lot of controversy over Michael Steele in his current position, and there are some people within the Republican Party who sort of want to see him ousted, if not publicly so. Uh, do you see him keeping his position? Uh, if not, why? Or, you know, what are your general thoughts on that? Um, I think uh, the question of Michael Steele holding on to his seat uh, is a question of two things. Number one, patience with Michael Steele and the operation of the Republican National Committee. Mr. Steele was very fortunate in this election. Uh, the tide broke in his way, uh, things which, frankly, he didn't have a lot to do with. He was here at Hoover, by the way, a couple months ago, and uh, we had a round table with a bunch of fellows, a little brad bad lunch, and we asked him, you know, what his expectations were, and he was very dramatic about it and said, oh, the camera's turned off, I don't want to say anything. And I said, you know, between you, us, you, know, between, between you guys and the four walls, I think we're going to pick up about 25 to 30 seats. I was, he was incredibly lowballing expectations. And this is back when people were talking about maybe 40 seats, not, not the 60 we ended up with. So he rides the wave. But that said, um, I think there, you know, the RNC has a real challenge ahead of itself. And the challenge is to, first of all, run the place better than it has been run the last couple of years. If you looked at them, at all times, watch how the money moves in politics. And if you've watched how the money moved in this cycle, uh, Republican donors, big donors, are much more comfortable giving to the senatorial committee or to the congressional committee than they were the national committee. And that's because they had much more confidence in those former two institutions. It cannot work that way in a presidential election. It has to go to the national committee and not to the congressional uh, committees. So Steele is going to have to either uh, show that he's going to do a better job of running the place on a daily basis, which means maybe bringing in a big name chief of staff or someone like that to, to be the operations chief, or he's going to have to step aside. And that leads to another question then, who do you want as your national chairman? Do you want essentially a bag man, somebody to go out and raise a lot of money, which means a former senator, a former big CEO or someone like that, or do you want a strategist? Someone's going to actually go out there and do nuts and bolts strategy in the, in the 50 states. So in the lame duck session of Congress coming up, they're supposed to find solutions to the budget deficit. And I was just thinking, you think if that's going to work or, or not? Uh, show of hands, everybody who thinks there's going to be a solution to the budget. <laughs> if this were not full of Dr. Pepper, I would kick this down the road to show you what I think will happen in that lame duck. <laughs> the, uh, the real question in the lame duck is what do they do? Forget the budget talk. The real question is what do they do with the Bush tax cuts? And uh, I, I find it staggering that there's actually talk that they will not deal with the Bush tax cuts, which means that Americans get their taxes raised and they have to go to the next session. Um, I, I think if Barack Obama is smart, he will probably get this done now. He'll uh, talk about eating dirt. He will compromise with Republicans on the tax cut and basically give them what they want and then move on from there. Um, if the Bush tax cuts go into effect, um, or actually they, they're repealed, um, then you go to the next session. He's already handed the Republicans their first gift of the next session, which would be to pass a measure in the House, which is saying we want those tax cuts back, and then send it to the Senate and force all these 2012 Democrats I mentioned to have to vote with it, which they probably would because they're all scared right now, and then it goes to the President. And does the President want to be in the business of vetoing a tax cut? I don't think so. So I think if, uh, you know, for all the talk about dealing with the budget, he's got to focus on those tax cuts and deal with that. Anybody else? Yeah. Who do you think the Republicans should go with in 2012? Who's your favorite candidate? <sighs> um, I don't really have a favorite candidate right now. I mean, it really, uh, and I'm not saying that just to be a, to be a weasel about it. Uh, I just, I, I want, I hope that they're going to come through the Hoover Institution or somewhere nearby where can I hear their message. And I, I'm, listen, I'm waiting to listen to something more than the obligatory, this president's fail, blah, blah, blah. You know, we need to, you know, retake Washington. Um, but I'm curious to what they actually, you know, X, Y, and Z, what they actually want to do as, um, as President of the United States. But um, just the other part of me thinks that, um, in a way, I, I don't care about 2012, I care more about 2016. And that if you cannot take down Obama, let's, you know, get the Senate back in 2012, 
build on those majorities in 2014, then get a Republican elected in 2016, and then you have both Republican president, Republican Congress, and a clean slate, and get to work at that point. Um, I don't like to publicly advocate blowing off elections, if you will, but there's something to be said about kind of starting new. It's a little analogous to um, the, uh, the 2000 and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the 1996 race, excuse me, with, uh, with uh, Bill Clinton and Bob Dole. Uh, for all the talk about Bill Clinton being, you know, dead man on arrival, uh, dead man walking after the 1994 election, he wasn't in that much trouble, actually, nationally. He was a good campaigner, and the Republicans, what did they end up doing? They put Bob Dole up against him. And Bob Dole's a wonderful man and all that, but he also was, frankly, expendable, you know. Uh, oddly, in kind of the same way John McCain was sort of expendable. So um, I don't see anything wrong with a lot of these guys who were running in 2012, who, had, who ran in 2008, and just letting them kind of run their course. So maybe if Mitt Romney serves that purpose. Uh, my only hope would be that if you run a Republican, and in a sense they're sacrificial because they cannot unseat the president, that they're just not weak candidates and they take other people down with them. And that leads me to Sarah Palin. And that's a concern with Palin. I don't know if she's gonna run or not. Um, part of me thinks that she's having so much fun. You know, she has a show coming up on, uh, on uh, what is it, uh, Outdoor Channel or something like that, Sarah Palin's Alaska, uh, to which someone sarcastically says, Sarah Palin's Alaska's in a rear view mirror. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry, she, she loves her state, I'm sure. But I mean, if you look at her life right now, she is, she is doing TV shows, and she is doing commentary on Fox, which, you know, pays some sweet bucks. She's going out there giving speeches and, you know, getting, getting some compensation for that. Uh, she's a little money-making enterprise, and she doesn't have to actually come down on things and make difficult decisions. She doesn't have to go out there and grub for votes and work the back roads of Iowa and New Hampshire and the early primary states. And I'm not sure if she'd want to give up this current good life to go back to the political life, because at the end of the day, what will she prove if she runs for president? she can probably prove that she could get the nomination. And I think right now if she ran, she would get the nomination. Uh, just watching her in this, in this off-year election, uh, she draws out there like no other Republican. And I think it'd be very hard to get in her way. Uh, I think she could easily get run over by her. Uh, would it be a very trouble, troublesome thing for the Republican Party? Yes, because what you'd see is Republicans up for re-election or running for the first time in other states having to decide where they with Sarah Palin. She would become the issue in a lot of states around America. Rather than the incumbent president or the president's party, it would be her. And I think that'd be very difficult for Republicans. So uh, I would hope she would stay out of it. But she could create that kind of dynamic which would cost Republicans in, uh, in other states. Why not? Um, I was just curious about what you thought um, a successful campaign for the next presidency would look like um, for the RNC, specifically speaking to like um, the disunity within the the party itself, and then also um, sort of the campaign for a candidate that would that would be able to particularly fiscally speak to the fringe groups in in the Republican Party and sort of recreate unity. What that would look like in the long term? So. Yeah, um, it's uh, that's a very good question, and. Uh, <laughs> I need to write this down, I think, for a few hours to really kind of figure out how to do it. It's off the top of my head. Um, I think what the successful Republican candidate has to do in 2012 is adopt Tea Party principles without taking it a little too far in terms of being mainstream acceptable. Um, and good examples of this are things like abolishing the education department, which, yes, I think Ronald Reagan talked about a long time ago, but just since then become problematic when you start proposing them. Uh, abolishing the IRS, you know, just the really the strong libertarian anti-government streak that runs through the Tea Party. You just can't do this as a national candidate. You just can't go in there saying, I'm going to blow up the federal government on my first day in office. It's just, <laughs> much as we'd all like to, it just it ain't going to happen. So I think you have to pick and choose and, and diffuse. Bush the Younger did a very clever job of this when he ran for president. There had been this fight within the Republican Party for years over the abortion plank in the party platform. Each, each convention, the Republicans would put a plank in their uh, platform dealing with abortion, and it was just too, regardless of your feelings, I don't want to offend anybody, regardless of your feelings on abortion, it was too far to the right in the sense that it said, we oppose abortion, you know, point blank, and will not make exceptions even for murder, rape, or incest. And in reality, if you ran as a pro-life pro candidate nationwide outside of that platform, you would say, I'm pro-life with the exception of rape and incest. And, in that in danger of the mother. Um, 
Bush found a way to change that language and soften it and when he ran for president in 2000, so he took that off the table. I think that's what you have to do as a Republican candidate, sort of take the, the strongest of the Tea Party, if you will, the most, you know, most extreme of the Tea Party, and try to neutralize it. So that means pick and choose and try to find, frankly, three things that they want to hear about and try to dodge the rest. Um, I think the first thing that, um, that a, a Republican candidate has to do is to, uh, frankly, appear to be non-threatening, if you will. Um, there, there is a there is a feeling that you come in too charging as a Republican with a with a Republican Congress, you're kind of wild-eyed, you're bent on destruction about the social the social safety net and government in general. So I think what you have to do is probably take a similar approach to what Bush Bush the younger did when he ran in 2000, where he took the idea of conservatism but put an adjective in front of it, a qualifier, and called it compassionate conservatism. So this is the idea that, yes, you know, I'm concerned about size and scope of government, but there is a function for government in terms of faith-based initiatives and things like that. So I think that's part of how the Republican Party has to modify itself. But then I think what, what the candidate in 2012 has to do is say, look it, I'm running against a guy who clearly thinks the government is the answer, and he's making government intrusive. And you know, deny this all he wants, but if you look at health care reform, if you look at bailouts and so forth, he believes that government needs to come right into the rescue anytime there's a problem. And there are crises in our country, you know, times in our country when government's the answer. You know, by God, if we you know, people fly airplanes into buildings, it's government's job to fix the problem. But in other cases, it's up to the individual, which is the history of our country, to take the initiative. So I think that's part of what the Republican candidate has to do, talk more about, you know, initiative and anti-government, if you want to call it, call it that. One more. One more. Okay. It's a free country. So the, the Tea Party and a lot of Republican candidates mm -hmm. ran, ran on trying to repeal health care, mm -hmm. and it just seems that that's unlikely, at least in the next two years. So do you think a lot of time will be wasted in Congress looking into that? And maybe does it really matter if time is wasted in Congress? I think uh, when you talk about um, looking into it, um, that's an interesting choice of words. You can just do straight votes saying, I want to repeal Obamacare, and you know, It'll get through, get through the House because it's party line, and it may maybe get through the Senate if there are enough scared Democrats, and then the President will kill it. So, but there are different little provisions inside Obamacare you can go at. But what I do if I'm the Republicans, I just try to sort of nickel and dime it to death. Uh, the Republicans, because they control the House, guess what? Not only they control votes, they control hearings. So at all times, I'd look at Obamacare, uh, Obamacare and the implementation, and I'd call hearings to, have people, to draw people up to the Hill and sit them down and saying, okay, you know, how's the IRS going to actually you know, look at people who don't do health care? Tell me how it's going to work. And so get people on the record saying, well, we're going to have to hire 50,000 new agents to go, to go tracking down people who don't do the health care. In other words, just try to pick, out a, pick apart Obamacare really by just you know, showing the, the shortcomings in it. If you can actually repeal it, you're probably talking about when in 2016 with that Republican president. But I think Speaker Boehner has actually talked about their various ways to kind of, you know, slow it down and, you know, chip away at it that way. But I would just put in on the uh, scope. And, and, and then under that regard, I think we're about to wrap up here. Uh, one of the key guys to watch in this Congress, Daryl Issa from San Diego. I don't know if any of you are in his district or not. But Mr. Issa is the new chairman of the House uh, Committee on Government and uh, Oversight, which means that he can call hearings and ask, you know, how governments run. He'll basically be the Obama administration's inquisitor if you will, so keep an eye on that gentleman. He could be a future candidate in California, by the way. Thank you so much. Thank you, okay. everyone, for coming. Thank you, guys. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.